New York Times bestselling novelist and screenwriter Lisa Lutz is beloved by mystery readers for her witty page turners filled with quirky, unforgettable characters. Her novels include the six comic crime novels in the popular Spellman series, which introduced a family of eccentric private investigators, as well as several standalone thrillers, including The Swallows and The Passenger. Lutz's newest novel, The Accomplice, is one of the most anticipated thrillers of 2022. Following a suspiciously tight friendship that turns deadly twice, The Accomplice is a twisty, darkly comic mystery that keeps readers guessing until the last word. For today's conversation, Lisa is joined by her friend and fellow suspense writer, internationally best-selling novelist Megan Abbott. Abbott is the Edgar Award-winning author of 10 thrillers, including The Turnout, Give Me Your Hand, and Dare Me. Signed copies of The Accomplice and all of Lisa's and Megan's hit novels are available from Left Bank Books, St. Louis's premier independent bookstore. about the accomplice and I, I I have to say and I know I told you this but then revisiting it to talk about it today I think it's one of my favorite books of the last several years I mean I just cannot get enough of it and just to sort of lay the premise out um this is a pair of best friends Luna and Owen who both at different points in their life became suspects in a murder investigation which in some ways it's like a kind of a high concept premise and I just wonder what what the seed for that came from. I mean I actually didn't think of it in any way as being high concept. I think I had like the very frame of the story so I sort of knew I knew I'd write about friends but I don't know that I was wed to the whole platonic thing uh, even at first Uh, but it was the first time I had a story where I knew the ending like I knew the twist before I really had the whole story. So then that takes away a lot of the work. And then it was really about like, how do I keep myself from getting bored writing? And then I just sort of explored relationships. Like I always like unusual relationships. So that was my big thing. Like I wanna get into this platonic uh, relationship that over many years and the way people change and the way they adjust their behavior with each other over time I also, because there are two different timelines, I love seeing where someone is in one point in time and then revisiting them later and having part of the mystery be just how they got to that other place in life. I love that kind of thing. I I always like not knowing something and getting an answer. Yes, and that telescoping back and forth in time with with Owen and Luna at the center and how much their lives change, but how some element in their relationship is sort of eternal is so interesting um, because they're, you know, they huge changes, the changes that because they're first 2002, they're in college and then 2019, they're in their early thirties. And a lot happens in those years, a lot of big transformational things. And, you know, they meet in college, but when we began, they're married, they have whole different lives. So a lot of you know, changes a lot of um, turns in the road, but there's something sort of so core to the two of them. Um, was that part of what you're talking about? I often think about like when, when and how we form these like really tight bonds. And I do think that like, you know, there are people who, you know, they have friends they've, they've had since, you know, grade school or, or even younger. But I do think that it gets, as everyone knows, it gets harder and harder as you get older. So there, but there's something about college and certainly for me, that general era, like it, not necessarily for me in college, but like right after college, some of my tightest friendships were were born. And I think that was really important. Like, I don't think if Owen and Luna, Luna met, even at like 28, would they be that type? But there's something about that moment in college where you're free and you're, you're figuring out who you really want to be yeah. without rules. I mean, you know, laws, basic laws. <laughs> Um, but you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not for them. You'll have to read the book. Uh, 
and you, I feel you, in How to Start a Fire, you have a little bit of that too about the college friendships. And I, I think of your book so much is circling around that age. And that's why they sort of remind me, and this one did a little of Secret History down at Tart, which is about like really tight. I mean, that's sort of a, that one is definitely without laws, but about yeah. a tight friends. Or I always think of the Salinger books about the Glass family. These sort of like really, in some ways, eccentric, um, oddball relationships that um, too, because you're at that age where you are sort of being formed still, and right. you form each other, and that you would be actually, not only would you might not be friends if you may, met later, you might be different people because there's something about that age. No, that's actually a really good point. I think about that a lot, like in terms of my characters, but even in terms of myself, like who would I be if I if I had not met certain people along the way? It's, it's, um, it's a fascinating thing. Like all, all of these little like moments, a tiny thing, something that might seem tiny can just completely change everything. Yes, yes. And I, I mean, and then sometimes in this case, some big things. That, yes. <laughs> um, and, and I want to avoid any spoilers. And I think people sort of can get the premise from this because there are some pretty hard turns very early. And I, I think... Yeah, I'm sure people can Google and there's some, but I like, not, I liked, I read, you know, when you get a galley is you don't have anything usually. I didn't even read the front piece and I, uh, there's a lot that happens right away. So, so I, but I think we can talk around it um, and people will get the idea, but I, you talked about Owen and Luna and this platonic friendship and you weren't sure it was going to be platonic and, and they, I mean, I love anything about male, close male, female friendships, because I've had a lot of them. I know you have had them too. And, and they're, they're different, especially yeah. at least, I mean, maybe less so now um, and, and in a different way of generations before us, but the sort of Gen X version of, and qualities of any time, but it's so fascinating to me, the intensity and complexity of it and moments when it might feel like it could have not been platonic, it could have been something else. And, and, and talk about that and how you did decide, you said you weren't sure at the beginning it would be platonic. Did you think maybe that they would have had a, a fling at some point or how did you figure all that out? Well, I debated the, the fling part, but I, I think that as I was sort of working out, like, cause for me, the whole, like, I don't know, I feel like some writers, everything comes to them and it in a maybe a little bit more complete sense. Like there's a lot of working through things in a very slow manner for me. So sometimes I can't even like, couldn't even say exactly or how something came about, but I do know that fairly early on, I realized, oh, I wanna write about a friendship. And then as I was developing their past, realizing that it might've been a question them at some point. And there were little scenes where like, it almost happens that some, some were cut, some stayed. I mean, it's always something that there is like a possibility when you're, you're young and you're single, but it was much more interesting to me to like have them realize that this mattered, uh, the friendship mattered. And these were two people who in very different ways had some difficulty with relationships. Right, and yes. so, and so, I liked the idea that they valued that friendship so much. I mean, that's such a cliche, but they really did. And, and they, I don't think they would have ever articulated it, but they, they did. They trusted that they needed that more than they ever would need anything romantic from the other person. I love what you're saying too, because I they do, big part of the book is how much trouble they have in, in relationships. So the notion that in some ways, and I want to talk a little bit more, more about the notion of being cursed, but one of the areas I think they both feel a little cursed or that they are the curse um in in relationships so they don't want to risk how important their platonic relationship is to sort of sully it with what is what has gone on in their in their romantic lives but their friendship is so romantic and and the fact that they've never done it done it <laughs> now i'm 19 i'm owen and luna done. this is what it brings me back to but there's this tension that's almost unbearable and so beautiful that you know really um independent of the thriller aspects which also are quite 
you know, really lots of turns, but it's, it, 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 it just adds this whole other element. I mean, you, it's like this dance you do with the reader of how much you'll give them um, <laughs> in that regard. And there's something so, um, I guess, particularly wrenching and maybe in our, in our current world, there's some things sort of the last pure thing. Um, <laughs> I don't know, it enables them to stay like, to pure with each other maybe is that do you think that's a little bit of it yeah definitely I mean I, I think that they don't trust their ability to handle a relationship well and I think they in a way are not in a relationship with each other but to protect uh, one another from themselves yeah, yeah, from yeah. all of the, the the chaos that tends to surround them I mean I think that's definitely Luna's thinking more than Owen's and for Owen, I think it's much more about uh, he's showing loyalty by remaining only her friend. It also makes for some really fascinating dynamics with the romantic partners in their lives, with their spouses and with other people they are involved with at different points. And, and I thought about that so much because I always like to write about really insular worlds. So this always comes up, but like how, like letting an outsider into that world. And I think it must be so hard for, um, because they are so close to, you know, for that, <clears throat> this becomes an issue in the book. Uh, like what happens when someone else comes into the mix and both, especially Luna really likes Owen's, uh, significant other and I and Owen's you know he's pretty I mean they really it's not like that it's um and they um, in some ways are very welcoming of this other person into their friends world but that's some that doesn't solve the problem <laughs> yeah well I mean because Luna and, and Owen have such a shared history and because they've relied on each other for so many years I don't think they really know how to to look to anyone else for whatever it is that they need in a relationship. So ultimately they get some things from their spouses, but and presumably sex, but um, <laughs> you know, they get the bulk of their sort of, their support and their communication needs met from one another. And so they have their secret meetings in a bar, um, which, you know, goes out the window once, uh, once Irene um, Owen's uh, wife dies, that's not really, I probably shouldn't, but it, it happens very early on. So I'm not really yeah. giving you- Yeah, I wasn't gonna say it because it was such a shock to me, but it's really- oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no I, I already know it, <laughs> but um, it's, it's in the first 10 pages. It's very early, so. Yeah. It's very early, so. Yeah, yeah, and and by the way, though we should say that Irene is a big character in the book. For other, you know, we really get to know her. And one of the other things I love about this book is how many eccentric and weird women there are. <laughs> <laughs> like Irene, it's not like I mean, I guess the standard version of this would Irene would be nice but boring or like something I think that both of them will be making choices that are more like regular people and they're the weirdos but they both marry weirdos and they're both <laughs> and even the, the, the cops that investigate they're not I wouldn't say they're weird but they're they're open to weirdness <laughs> oh, yeah. interested by it so that's something I love about your voice and the way you view the world but is there something in you that's resistant to writing like a quote a, like a basic person <laughs> oh so this is one of those things where it's like there I have two thoughts on this because I I often you know you end up reading different people's comments on things and they I always see quirky or eccentric characters and I'm oh I, I always think, you know, they're actually kind of just like people I know. I mean, I think some people front better than other people, but I don't know anyone who I don't think has a lot of weirdo in them. Yeah. So for me, like when I meet a person who feels sort of very straight and normal, I get really uneasy. Like I'm like, there's, yeah. there has to be something there. And if there's not, either it's boring or it's terrifying because there is something and it's so deep, it's sick. I realize I'm throwing out some judgments, but I don't understand the whole idea of like non-eccentrics. Like everyone's eccentric if you get to know them. Absolutely. I think it's so interesting. I guess it maybe speaks to larger issues about discomfort with with character, you know, like it's sort of discomfort with ourselves. Oh, definitely. I would also argue that, let's say the book, all the characters were 
the way they, well, all the male characters were the way they are, but all the female characters, you had at least two more very normal female characters. No one would notice the eccentricity because we're so used to female characters being kind of more banal and certainly not as eccentric and not, you definitely wouldn't call them weird. Like whenever I watch like television shows, I'm always like, why are there like four really funny guys and only one funny woman? Yes. Like, it's always stuff like that where I'm like, what, am, what is this? This is ridiculous. It makes me crazy. Yeah. That's not my experience in life. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh that it were <laughs> yeah. um, but it is like I think it's so interesting because it's not anything they're doing that's weird it's just that I think there's a sort of you have an acceptance about the way the mind works and the way our brains work and that you know like as you say deep down we're all um we're all the people we are because of a series of, of strange and sometimes terrible things that have happened to us that have sort of created the version we are. And we put up various defenses or we can't and we reveal ourselves with, you know, our sort of tics and eccentricities. And um, there's something, I don't know, I, I guess it feels very, I get what you're saying about normal people seeming very frightening in your books because they do, because everybody else, you know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> they feel very sinister because you have the sense that they're able to hide, really hide something. And that's, that's the dangerous person. Yeah. And I also think that like when, if someone really fronts as normal and let's say they are on some like sort of bizarre way to, I don't know how you, you quantify that. Let's say they are sort of normal. They're, there's still something like with all the different things that can happen to you in life, the fact that you're, you're some sort of cookie cutter version of something, that's an effort. You're yeah. making an effort to do that. And I would, I just question why. You also, the thing like, I always think is a sign of a great writer is when secondary characters are, aren't just there because of the thing they have the service they have to perform in in the book you know this is the cop or the waitress diner waitress or any of these things and I think well, one of the things you do is you give them all something there's something you're giving them and maybe that's sort of what's reading as uh is what you don't normally get that you know this is sort of like what um uh, you just don't have anyone that's just filling, just filling their for their function in the book to move the story forward. Um, and I don't know, that feels very generous of a writer to me that you're gonna spend the time to to give them some odd trait or a characteristic. No, I appreciate that. I mean, you, it's so there's always this effort, like when you're when you're writing to like care a little bit about everyone in some way. So, I mean, I really liked writing the cops because they, and, and they, are, they are secondary characters, but once you give them a little bit of, of, of life or a background or anything, it's much more interesting to, to write them. And then, yes. then there are different directions you can go. It gives you a lot more freedom. But yes. I also realized that like, so just like the, how we become ourselves is a series of, of events, <laughs> however good or bad. <laughs> But like, do you ever find that when you're writing a character, as you're layering that in, almost like in life, that character then changes, you realize, oh, I've done this. So now this has to be like this. There's this whole other thing that happens with ripple effect that can be frustrating because sometimes you think, oh, if they're this person, they can do this later. But if you've changed them over time, they can't do that later, you realize. That's right. So it's like this trap door falls beneath you because now you realize you have to figure something new out. And I think that's sort of maybe the part about what you were talking at the very beginning about what was keeping you interested in when you were writing. And I think part of it in some ways is that scary thing. And I would say about the cops who are investigating the, the present day, uh, <laughs> yeah, where, right. um, they are kind of like interesting double of Owen and Luna. I mean, one of the reasons that you can imagine any cop would be very suspicious is it's, it's very unusual in your life to have one murder investigation um, in your in your circle, but to have two is, you right. know, um, and I think I'm sort of fascinated the way that um, 
Luna in particular carries that for a number of reasons. Um, the notion that both of them are sort of have a curse, have like a cloud over them, are like a typhoid Mary situation, right? Um, and it's sort of like a, a classic noir thing, right? That you are the darkness and you bring it. And uh, but I think here it's used to very different effect. Um, um, but I wondered, how, did that come in at, slowly or was that always part of it for you? I always knew that Luna had this thing she was keeping a secret. And I think whenever I have something that's like, I know is going to be big. I know this was the case with the passenger. Where I was trying to figure out well, what did the woman run from to begin with? As I'm writing, it's like a placeholder and I'm, I'm allowing that whole concept to marinate and trying to figure out how am I going to make this work? Because, you know, with Luna, it, she had a secret and I needed that secret to matter. I, it, it couldn't be one of those secrets where you reveal it at the end and it's like, oh. so, but it also, for me, like I need things to feel, at least with this book, especially, I needed it to feel plausible. That just took a while. And then I think a lot about guilt. So for me, guilt is something that I go back to a lot because I think it tells you so much about a character. Like, I don't know, I really think guilt's great. Like I think people <laughs> should feel guilt, like people who feel guilty, I trust. People who like, like if they do something like, yeah, sure, maybe technically not their fault, but it's, if, if, if it weren't for them, it, something wouldn't happen. Like, let's say you, I, you open your car door, someone swerves, someone else gets hit, blah, blah, blah. But you're totally allowed to open your car door. A lot of people would say, okay, so-and-so got hurt because I, I did something totally legal. I don't feel guilty at all. I think it's okay to feel guilty. It doesn't mean you are guilty, but to feel guilty, to recognize that if it weren't for you, this wouldn't happen, this person wouldn't be hurt. That to me is like very reasonable and a healthy thing. So I think about that sort of how someone relates to their past, their behavior, and, you know, how much they take ownership of that. Yeah, it makes me think of the distinction between guilt and shame, and shame feels much more dangerous to other people. I, I think the way you're talking about guilt, it's sort of, you're almost like you're talking about an awareness that some people are forced by circumstance to have very young of how much their actions and their lack of actions can affect other people. And it makes you a kinder person. And in some ways, it makes Luna very a more defended. She's, def, you know, she has a lot of guardrails up because of that. And that feels right. And, and I wondered too, if that was someone like that. I mean, you do write a lot of characters with, with that are very defended, I would say. Which, which is, <laughs> no. But uh, I think particularly, like we understand ultimately, and even early on a lot about that, but was, is it hard? I, is, I mean, even Owen can't get past some of the guardrails with, with her. Was it hard to write someone? So um, she's protecting other people from herself. So that sort of creates, I guess, a, a could create a chasm. Like, how do I get this through to the reader when she's sort of put up these, um, these castle walls? I think that that's why humor is, was essential with this book because that's how you work around that kind of thing. And you sort of, you can warm someone up without changing their inherent behavior. I think, I, I know when I was reading it, I kept texting you some sections that were, <laughs> I feel like I should have started with how funny this book is. And especially with this particular deadpan <laughs> dryness that um, is, is part of, I think, what makes you keep one, never wanting it to end because it, it just feels, you do feel like you become the third person in this friendship. You want to be, you know, you want to <laughs> hang out with them. And that's what made me um, think and hope. I mean, will we maybe Owen and Luna return? I don't know. I mean, they were, I enjoyed writing them. I, I would be open to it, but you know, if a third incident happened in their vicinity, <laughs> I do like, I sort of like the idea of them lasting and uh, <laughs> I'm not sure they could. I mean, I guess they could weaponize it and become like a uh, murder she wrote. <laughs> they could actually, they could be actually seeking out situations where a murder could occur and I was waiting it out. <laughs> My God.
<laughs> now I'm trying to picture them being like sort of PIs together. And just yeah. Yes, I can see it. I can see it. But that reminds me of another thing I wanted to ask. We're saying two time periods, but you actually, there's a lot in between the two time periods. Right. Too. I mean, was that, yeah. a, was that in the revision, like the sort of slicing and dicing more, or did, were you figuring that out as you went? I wrote them, you know, I would write the uh, past and then like, let's call it the present. It's 2019. I would write those in the order you read them. But then as I was revising, I was inserting uh, stuff in the middle to flesh out Irene, the uh, Owen's wife. Cause I just think like, um, A, the more I thought about her, the more I liked her. And, but I also thought it just felt wrong to have a character die and not like give that character some life yeah. you know, afterwards, so. So it was instinctual for you that you didn't want her to be the dead, the dead woman at the start of the book. It became weird as I was writing it. Like, I, I, yeah, it was definitely just something like, oh, I no, I, I need to do more with her. And then there were some sort of story twists I worked into that, but it was all really about fleshing her out, letting you know who she was. Because she wouldn't have been in their life if she wasn't kind of great on her own and interesting on her own. That's right. That's right. They would not have let her in, uh, in, in their world. Yeah, that feels so true. I loved her. <laughs> <laughs> She's amazing. Um, but I loved her when her first scene in that tracksuit. <laughs> when she wearing that tracksuit. Um, anyway, she dresses like one of the guys from The Sopranos. <laughs> Yeah. like all she ever wears <laughs> they immediately love her i mean it's just the, i guess that's what i mean about like eccentric just because that's not that's not typical of a 30 year old fairly wealthy woman <laughs> like, i know but i wish it were i mean in queens that is like it is so <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. it's very common yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh um oh wait i have to i know we're running out of time but i, I want to ask you about the parlor game <laughs> oh yes thank you so uh, I had to write a book club letter and uh, I, I'm always uneasy with those things because I, I don't, it's like not a language that's, that's comfortable for me. Like, oh, thank you for reading my book. And I do, thank you, genuinely, thank you. If you've read it, I really appreciate it. But I, I don't know how to intro a book that way. So I came up with this game you could play at your book club for it. So basically you need to get stickers. I would get red, orange, and blue stickers and then so the red sticker designates someone who could definitely be a murderer. <laughs> Not necessarily they have murdered anyone, yeah. but could definitely do it. Yeah. Orange is someone who maybe under a very specific set of circumstances and blue, never murder, never murder. Then, then as you're like eating canapes and sipping whatever you're sipping, <laughs> you, you stick whatever sticker on the back of someone who, and yeah, whatever you think they are. And then when everyone's done with stickering each person in the room, the person, like if you, you stickered my back, I guess the tally of each. Oh, I and love the person that. closest wins. And I think they should win something like fancy, like a nice bottle of something. Yes, yes. That's amazing. It's sort of like a deranged version of Kiss, Mary Kill. <laughs> 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 oh, very, oh that sounds so oh, that's like a terrifying too it would really tell you a lot about what your friends think of you <laughs> no i know it, it could go wrong I, oh yeah i in the letter i i i warn everyone that you got to know who you're dealing with if you've got any loose cannons there <laughs> maybe you don't play this game but i do think it would be fun to play and i i would like to I also know that I personally would be so offended if I didn't get a whole bunch of red ones, which feels wrong, especially since I talk so much about guilt. But yeah. Yeah. yes, yes. But I have to say, I think you would be a great accomplice in anything. I would always, <laughs> I would always count on you for an accomplice, and you have in fact been an accomplice many times to many things I can think of. This has been so fun, and yeah. I just want to tell everybody again to buy this book. It is really just an absolute I, I just wanted to even looking at it again this morning I wanted to read the whole thing again <laughs> I've been seeing the responses creeping in and, and everyone seems to feel the same way and I'm not surprised so um, I can't wait to have it, it get out there in the world thanks so much for doing this Megan oh my pleasure mm -hmm.